there was a Sunday school teacher who was teaching her students about the Ten Commandments. And after explaining the commandment to honor your mother and father, she asked, is there a commandment that teaches us how to treat our brothers and sisters? One hand immediately shot up, and he said, thou shall not kill. <laughs> Commandments. You know, maybe we, um, I don't know, bristle with the word commandment. Maybe it seems a little heavy-handed. I mean, not that we're into lawlessness, but maybe especially in our country, we value freedom and independence. The word commandment just sort of seems to land heavy, you know? And uh, even our relationship with God, you know, who's good and loving, the word the commandment just sounds just, just sort of burdensome, I guess. You know, even in our, all of our relationships, even our most important or intimate ones, there's, there's, there's rules for, for engagement, I guess. And if we don't think there's rules for our relationships, then um, guys, try forgetting your anniversary uh, or your wife's birthday and see if there's not sort of rules uh, in our relationships. Of course, we should do so many things out of love, but sometimes we need those expectations, too, to just help guide us uh, in those relationships. The same is, is true of God. You know, I was struck in our, in our psalm, actually, blessed are the, those who follow the law of the Lord, but in the verses, the, the author of the psalm, it's, you can tell he's like desiring the law. Like he's like hungering for it, and he asks the Lord, please help me to, to follow your law, to know it, to really have it in my heart so that I can, I can live more fully. And we see a similar sentiment in our first reading from, from Sirach, and that book from, of Sirach is just like a, a summary, a compilation of, of the wisdom of, of Israel. And we hear, if you, if you choose, you can follow the commandments. And the author even says that we should like reach out for those to know what God wants us to do and, and how to live so that we can live, so that we can know salvation, so that we can know God's life. As Israel developed, of course, there's there a lot of rules that, that, that came about, and people like the scribes and the Pharisees, it was like their, their full-time job to pay attention to all, the, to all the laws. And they were known for that. They were actually revered for that, you know? They were thought of being like these super good holy people because they, they knew the law up and down and followed it to the, to the T. And for them, that was just so important to, to not fall into sin, to, to not become ritually impure, like all these kind of things. But... And the law was there to, to guide a relationship, not to replace it. And mere observance of a, of a law, of a rule, it doesn't, it doesn't bring forth love. So we could wonder, like, did the scribes and Pharisees, did they have a, a, a love of God? Or just a love of, of the law? Did they have a relationship with God and his covenant? Or did they have just a relationship with the law? And that was their righteousness, and so Jesus, to his disciples here on the Sermon on the Mount, says, unless your righteousness surpasses that of the scribes and the Pharisees, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. It would have been mind-blowing because the people thought the scribes and Pharisees must have been, you know, the first in line to inherit the kingdom because they knew all the, all the rules so well and followed that. Of course, a lot of times they laid those as burdens. But Jesus comes not to, to replace uh, the law, but to actually... Um, intensify it and make it go even deeper. So we hear it three times, and we'll hear it again next week. Jesus say, you have heard it said, but I say to you. This is earth-shattering as well, because he's quoting Moses, and Moses was the great giver of the law of God. He was the, the goat. He was the ultimate authority. And so rabbis throughout the centuries, all their teaching, it, it had to go back to the teaching of, of Moses. It's ultimate authority. So for Jesus to say, well, Moses said, but I say, he's basically saying his authority is greater than the Torah, than, than, than Moses, which means he speaks with the authority of God himself, which would have been, again, shocking. It kind of reminds me of um, C.S. Lewis. He has these three L's uh, about Jesus and the things that he says. And when Jesus says things like, like, I'm God, he's either a liar or a lunatic, or the Lord. And if he's one of the first two, then we shouldn't have anything to do with him. But if he's the Lord, and of course we know that he is, it's 
second person of the Trinity made incarnate, the word made flesh, that it means everything to us. So Jesus says, you have heard it said, you shall not kill, but, but I say to you, you shouldn't even be angry with one another. You know, sometimes we, um, we have the, uh, the temptation maybe to think of ourselves or other people, as long as I haven't killed anybody, I'm really pretty good. But God has more in store for us. This is, this is beloved daughters and sons. So Jesus says, even if there's anger in your heart, you know, that could probably lead to that. How many of us have said, I could have just killed that person? Not that we actually planned on homicide. But you know, there's, Jesus wants to bring healing and, and newness to the very depth of our hearts, our minds, our spirit. So as you've heard it said, shall not commit adultery, but I say to you, you need to just have lustful thoughts, impure materials. And that is, is also um, not for our, our flourishing. Again, he wants to bring newness and, and healing to the very depths of our, of our spirit, of our, of our minds and our hearts so that they can be more conformed to his. He says, you shall not, uh, you've heard it said that you be mindful of your oaths, but I tell you, don't swear an oath at all. Now, back then, Oath-taking like, was like, popular to do. Like, people were making oaths on all sorts of things that they didn't need to make oaths for. Like, we're making oaths about everything, you know? And so it really got out of control. And so Jesus is like, just don't do that. Like, yet, like, like your yes mean yes, your no mean no. Basically, like, why do you need to swear an oath, an oath, sorry, if, uh, if you're just truthful in everything that you, that you say? And just be honest and sincere in your life. And even now, we have oaths, like in courts and stuff, because just we live in a fallen world. And the people swearing these oaths, we're really kind of violating the second commandment to uh, not say the Lord's name in vain. So too, we hear like, I swear to God. Now, if you're like me, every time someone says, I swear to God, aren't we a little bit suspicious, <laughs> right, about what they say? No point for an oath. Again, God wants to bring completeness to our mind, heart, spirits, and in every way. And all this is just to conform us more to his life. In the end, the Sermon on the Mount is about, it's about Jesus. And he's presenting us uh, how he lives so that we who belong to him can live that way as well and become the best version of ourselves. Of course, all this is hard. It's been said that the Christian life is not difficult, it's impossible. Impossible without the grace of God, impossible just on our own. Because we know we need the, the movement of the Holy Spirit in our, in our lives to, to help us to do this. We know we need the grace of God in our lives to help us to do this through the sacraments and other ways. And so as we encounter Christ here in the Mass today, let's remember again the depth of his love for us, the call that he has to himself, so that when we allow him to fill us with his life, we enter more fully into his life. And living his life is the source of our flourishing.